Jackie. Good um, morning. Thanks so much for coming um, to this first series of our uh, Wilma Hale web, web seminars. Um, thanks for taking the time. I know that you have a very busy schedule. Um, we're just going to um, ask a couple of questions. And the first, maybe just by way of introduction, we all know that you are um, the Director General of the LCA, the London Court of International Arbitration. But maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, your career in international arbitration otherwise before you join the LCA. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for having me here. It's very exciting. Um, yeah, my career in arbitration started rather randomly um, because I was looking for a subject in university to write a paper on, and actually through my parents, who are doctors, and I think basically knew one lawyer, said, go speak to that lawyer that happened to be Pete Saunders. <laughs> so not surprisingly, he suggested I do something with arbitration, which I had to look up in a dictionary because I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, and from then on, it just continued. I did my little paper, I did my PhD, went to work for um, first a tribunal as a secretary for a year, and then for some law firms where increasingly I spent time sitting as arbitrator and, and acting as counsel in arbitrations. Um, and in the end, ultimately uh, decided that it would be um, good also to see things from another angle, which is the institutional angle, which got me to London about a year ago. Very good. And, and talking about this angle, um, as a private practitioner before, I'm sure you used the LCA as an institution like others. Um, how would you compare that user perspective, that outside perspective, with now the inside perspective yeah. within the institution? Yeah. Well, it, it is interesting because on some level you do, of course, uh, no more. Now that you see things from the inside, you see some of the mechanics and you can sort of see the things that look very easy and efficient um, actually require quite a bit of work. You, you Normally you would just see the output. At the same time, especially when I sat as LCA arbitrator, I did find the whole process quite transparent anyhow. You, you knew who the caseworker was that you were dealing with. You knew who the um, uh, people in accounts were that you were communicating with. So when I did my first um, uh, little tour through the office, it felt like, oh, this is Brenda, who I've been communicating with for quite some time already. Yeah. So it was a bit of a homecoming. But of course, at the same time, you, you, once you're there, you start to see, oh, these are the bigger questions. These are the political issues. These are the, the, the points where we can improve. And, and, and it becomes more interesting. But in a way, it was not as alien as you might have thought or as I might have expected beforehand. Interesting. That's the hands-on approach that the LCA is probably yes. always quite well known for. Um, you've just mentioned sort of the issues and, and potential challenges um, when you joined the LCA. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what those were, but also the highlights yeah. um, since yeah. you were appointed as, <laughs> as uh, Director General. Well, I think highlights and, and challenges go hand in hand. Um, what was probably the biggest challenge and at the same time the biggest opportunity when I arrived in May, I officially took over in July last year, the new rules were going to come into force on the 1st of October and there had been a long gestation period that I was not really part of with one or two exceptions. You know, pretty much the work had been done, but it created an enormous opportunity on the one hand to go out and speak with people about the new rules but also quite a bit of a well pressure because we had to go out and we had to so from not knowing things to begin with you suddenly had to go out and explain what was new and what was different people would ask questions about well why did you decide to do this well a I didn't know much about the previous <laughs> practice B I didn't know anything about the reasons for changing it um, and and C I was getting to grips with you know just running an organization and and trying to to make things um, operate uh, smoothly as smoothly as before but it created a fantastic opportunity because if you are new and People are curious to get to know you, basically. It's like, oh, well, nice to meet you. But now we had a real topic. Mm. So to a large extent, also together with Sarah Lancaster, the registrar, we visited a lot of London law firms. Um, I did a lot of overseas trips, participated in, in panels and all that, where people had something concrete that they wanted mm -hmm. to discuss with me. So that was, that was very uh, challenging and, and useful, I think. 
internally or in terms of um, what struck me over the course of the first year is I think there's been a change uh, in how people um, perceive institutions and how institutions effectively compete with each other. Um, in the old days, I think people would just accept that there are different institutions and they all have their little domains and they all live happily together and that's fine. I think increasingly, and to some extent that is good, people are, um, institutions are competing and I'm very anxious that we don't do so in an aggressive and, and inappropriate way, but I do think users are entitled to know why they would choose institution X or institution Y and finding a balance in being gentlemanlike and still uh, 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 take part effectively in this in this new environment is a bit of a challenge. And in that context the fact that the LCA was potentially traditionally seen as more UK heavy or eccentric or potentially um, uh, yeah London based you are, I believe, the first non-UK yeah. national yeah. leading the LCA. Is that something that sort of played into this a little? Yes, and I think it, it, it um, well, that is one of the interesting bits about the LCA, that it is very much a London-based institution, but at the same time very in international. And what we need to make sure is that we keep both, that we, we, we preserve what is our strength, that we are firmly seated in this environment here, that a lot of our cases do take place here, at least are seated here with good court support and all that. But at the same time, we are truly international. And, and again, being a foreigner may have created um, a bit of, you know, it's, that was new for everybody. At the same time, it, it was a very, when the board appointed me, that was clearly a sign what they wanted to do with the LCIA. So that made it easier in a way. If I go out there, it, it's a pretty obvious thing that the LCA doesn't think of itself as a purely London-based, London-focused entity. And I guess the statistics also show that it's actually not so English-focused no. and London-based no. as one would no. think. No, and, and, and that was when you were talking about what was new, what did you notice. What I found quite interesting when I started to look at some of the statistics and, and, and uh, numbers um, we have, for instance, a lot of Russian and CIS-related cases. Those are cases where there's really nothing English about the case. The parties are perhaps both Russian or, or one Russian and one from somewhere else, but, but in the CIS region. Um, but they choose London as a seat, English law, and LCIA. That's their choice. That's not us sort of imposing that on them. And um, seeing those patterns made me realize things are more complicated. It is not about de being a domestic institution. There is something special about London, which is not unique to the LCIA, but English law is applicable in certain types of contracts. You're coming, as a Dutch practitioner, coming to London, <laughs> nobody in their right minds chooses Dutch law you know, for the sake <laughs> of it, but a lot of people choose English law simply because it is well developed in certain mm -hmm. areas, and, and in a way we benefit from, from that. Mm -hmm. Would you think that that's one of the sort of major selling points, you know, English law being the law um, chosen um, in a lot of contracts, when you say you go out and travel and sort of talk about L the LCA and the new LCA rules, is that one of the main selling points for arbitrating in London and under the rules? And in what are there others? Yeah, it's a double. It's a it's a bit of a mixed message, I would say, because for some. Yes, it is, and for some types of disputes, yes, especially where there is a, um, a sort of consensus in the industry, like in financial transactions, mm -hmm. a lot of people choose English law. Um, and if people, for other reasons, think that this, this combination of the law and the seat is helpful, then you know, be my guest. And, and we are, I think, better equipped than many other institutions to tap the market here to find good arbitrators. But the, as I said, the message is mixed because there is no... Um, no need to do so and uh, other institutions may traditionally have a better reputation when it comes to accommodating arbitrations that have no connection with the local seat. So that's what I'm trying to tell people. If you want to have your seat in Singapore and if you want to have whatever law, that's fine. We can still help you and we can still accommodate it within the LCIA system. 
And I'm curious whether there are any cultural differences when it comes to selling the LCA um, and arbitrating under uh, the LCA rule. So when you go to Latin America, or when you go to Russia, you say you have a lot of cases in that region, or if you go to Asia, um, are they different reasons why people are attracted to arbitrating with the LCA? Yes, I mean, here to some extent I also draw from my experience as LCA arbitrator, where I remember doing a case where both parties were represented by English law firms, and um, in a procedural conference call, there was unanimity on few things, but on some procedural things, there was a lot of unanimity between counsel that we would do things in the normal way. And I remember looking at my neighbor, who was a lawyer from Texas, thinking, well, I don't know what normal is to him, but it's likely to be a little <laughs> bit different than it is for me. And none of the parties' representatives I think appreciated that, that what they thought was normal was definitely not normal for everybody in the room. I think in some cases what we see is that everybody in the room shares the same values and expectations mm -hmm. and then perhaps cases may be seen as more sort of London focused. In other cases not at all and when people choose LCIA um, some will think that that means buying into a certain tradition and others will not. So it is quite varied and mm -hmm. Um, what I do see is if you, go, if you go out and speak to different people in different cultures, arbitration is simply perceived differently. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's not specific to LCA arbitration, but, yeah. yeah. That's very interesting. Um, you mentioned as one of the highlights of um, your time with um, the LCA, of course, the fact that the new rules entered into force in October um, last year. Now, it's been almost a year that we have those rules and, and of course we're all curious to know um, what the experience is with the new rules. How would you describe that experience overall um, from the institution? Yeah. Well, I think first of all, the, um, what, what occupied us all quite a lot was simply implementing the rules. I mean, it, it, it sounds innocuous, but every template, every th communication needs to be amended, needs to be updated. Um, there were some developments which were wonderful, such as we now have electronic filing, where um, that's clearly something that people um, are interested in, not in the least, I think, because it allows them to pay the registration fee by credit card. Mm -hmm. But we discovered, small thing, that if we thought it was helpful for people to have a sort of web form that they could fill out, um, actually some law firms prefer to use their own templates, so they would attach a document which was not necessarily in sync with the information that was on the web form. So we now give you the option. You either fill out the form or you attach just your standard document as a PDF but still benefit from the, uh, the credit card payment option. Um, so it was on the one hand interesting to be part of the implementation and also to sort of see like of course the drafters thought about oh electronic filing but didn't really think about the mechanics of making that work and we've clearly made progress in, in, in accommodating that. We have seen other changes that are more subtle. Um, I don't think we have seen massive changes of, um, of approach. Uh, there is a, a, a greater drive for efficiency and effectiveness which does change uh, rather subtly some things. For instance, with the requirement within 21 days um, to, to basically think about the um, structure of the procedure. We, we now require immediate deposits up front because the arbitrators need to be in funds to have that initial discussion. So uh, that has led to some changes in practice. I think one interesting development, which again goes to this efficiency and effectiveness, um, as all other institutions have done, we struggled with how do we how do we curb the duration? And I think we, we actually didn't have as much of a problem as some other institutions, but still we want to make sure that the awards are produced as, as soon as reasonably possible. So one of the new gimmicks in the rules is the requirement that arbitrators give thought to when are they going to deliberate and that they communicate that with the parties, which I think is a fantastic, you know, I take no credit for that, it was not my invention, but I think it's a very good self-policing mechanism. And what we're seeing is that some arbitrators are really taking this to um, its fullest uh, uh, by, by in their initial procedure order when they start talking about the 
structure of the arbitration say this is the basic exchange submission uh, schedule, uh, submissions for this and this, then and then, hearing, post-submission briefs, and then on the following days the tribunal will meet to deliberate. Mm -hmm. Of course, if the schedule is amended, then that will be amended, but thinking in advance about when the tribunal is going to deliberate, I think that is sort of best practice being developed under the new rules. And, communicate, communicating and communi precisely to the parties. Being transparent about it. Yeah, Very yeah. Not everybody does that. It's not a requirement, but I think you can see that sort of good practice being developed. One of the points, of course, that everyone is also curious to hear about, because there was just so much debate um, when the um, new rules were issued, is the annex and the guidelines um, for party representatives. So what's your take on it now that we've been you yeah. know, a year in, yeah. if I may say? Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it is also one of the issues that a lot of people want to hear about. And, and maybe paradoxically, it is not something where I have a lot to tell in terms of actual practice. What we have not seen is, for instance, people have asked, are you going to publish a, a digest of decisions based on Article 18 where tribunals have issued sanctions? Um, well, we haven't seen those, so we're clearly not doing a digest. But still, because it is such a, a big deal, um, I think it very much influences people's uh, perception of what LCIA arbitration stands for. Um, and the fact that I am constantly invited to discuss it with, with users means that it is on people's minds. And people tell me about how they struggle with certain things and how they like certain things. Um, for instance, what I discussed recently in, in an English firm is where somebody was saying, well, it helped me have a discussion with the client who felt uncomfortable about potentially having me um, act in a way that might not be consistent with what he was expecting, where th the solicitor was able to say, well, you know, in the end, I'll have to step down if you think that this is not what you want. Mm -hmm. But just for your information, the next person you're going to hire on this case will be bound by the same obligations. Mm -hmm. and. That's sort of what you bargain for when you bargain for LCA arbitration. And even though the norms are fairly um, high level and, and things like you shall not lie to the tribunal should not really hopefully make that much of a difference, I think it is a, a theme, it is a sort of underlying expectation that is now created by the rules which seems to have some effect but I cannot prove that or demonstrate that by saying oh you know we've got all these procedural orders and decisions because it doesn't have that kind of concrete output. Which would have been actually rather, you know, bad news had you had <laughs> 10 decisions on precisely, sanctions precisely. under Article yes. 18. Yes. So what you're saying is the fact that you, someone has put it down um, on, in writing as an annex to the rule has already given people a sort of, you know, almost like a quality um, yes. control, you know, stamp. Um, and um, it is something that potentially is used much more behind the scenes rather yes. than in the real... And I think what, what is also important to realize about those provisions is they are really there to enhance transparency because if you are in a situation where different people from different cultures have different expectations about the do's and the don'ts, it is not necessarily the case, other than thou shalt not lie, that, it, that the LCA f rules and the annex force a particular procedure. Mm -hmm. What it forces the parties in the tribunal to do is to have it out and to sort of discuss, well, under my system, I'm actually prevented from participating in this document discovery uh, system. Whereas previously, you could imagine a situation where a tribunal orders something expecting that everybody will understand that that implies certain obligations, half of the room thinks the same and will produce or will not produce. And the other is like, wow, I'm not even going to play ball. And that's what we're trying to, to avoid. The other sort of innovation, major innovation, because there were of course many others, um, under the new rules was the emergency arbitrator proceedings. Um, now that sits in the existing framework um, of already um, the possibility of having an expedited um, formation of the arbitral tribunal under the LCA rules. Now, having set myself as an emergency arbitrator just in another um, set of rules, I'm curious to hear, did you have any emergency arbitrator um, proceedings yet? And, you know, what's your view 
on, on, the new, on this new um, institution? Well, I'm glad you asked this because it is one of the issues that I feel quite strongly about. I feel strongly about several issues, but this one in particular, having also sat quite a bit as, as, as emergency arbitrator before I, I arrived here, um, we've not yet had cases, which is understandable because the provisions have a different temporal scope. So the rules entered into force on the 1st of October, but for the emergency provisions, it is only for uh, agreements concluded since then. So there's always a bit of lead time. But what we have seen, quite interestingly, you mentioned expedited proceedings. Um, I think there is an increase in um, uh, those cases and in people requesting expedited appointment. Um, per personally, I think it may have to do with the numbering because it's now 9A and 9B. It is almost <laughs> as if people are suddenly, oh, I didn't realize 9A yeah. was there. And 9A is actually quite innovative. Very few institutions have something like it. Um, I used to think that the added benefit of expedited proceedings wasn't so large because our appointment mechanism is pretty swift anyhow compared to other institutions. But um, uh, it is clearly having an effect, and, and we do have cases where literally over two or three days a full-fledged tribunal is appointed, um, and we're trying to steer that. This is an example of cases where we now have notes for arbitrators, notes on emergency arbitration proceedings, and we've given examples of sort of cases where you do and don't get expedited formation. I don't want to suggest that that's an identical standard to emergency procedure, but there are clearly similarities. And what we're seeing, or what we're seeing, is people not requesting expedited formation where you would think, oh, actually, had they tried, they probably would have gotten it. And conversely, people complaining that somebody's been, you know, failing to pay for quite a lot of time and therefore it is by now urgent, you know, that doesn't really do the trick. But I think a more sophisticated use of this interesting tool is, is, seems to be developing. Now we've talked about the new LCA rules, the 2014 rules, maybe just taking a step back and thinking about arbitration a bit more broadly. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on some of the themes that are discussed currently in various fora. Um, one of those um, is, of course, diversity in international arbitration, and that's um, based on gender, but also d um, based on geographical yeah. diversity. Um, how does DLCA deal with those yeah. concerns? Well, uh, I think it, it's not a good point. And diversity is sort of the ticket <laughs> that I um, decided before I joined that I really felt this was something, not because of you know, me personally, but I think <coughs> it, it is it is a, a topic which, and, which a lot of people are currently um, um, aware of and, and aware of the need to be more inclusive. When I arrived, I was pleased to see that the LCA was one of the few institutions, although it's now increasing, who at least give statistics. And I think one of the um, special, uh, that is one of the things that institutions can do that other users cannot as easily do. So we give statistics. We give statistics on gender, and we give statistics on first-time appointees. We also obviously give information on nationality of arbitrators, that sort of thing. But that is, in a way, almost easier to do because often the clause guides you or the, just the fact that the parties have different nationalities. Uh, I think gender and age are currently the, the focus of diversity without suggesting that cultural uh, diversity is, is, is of secondary importance, but we think I think we have less of an issue or less of a concern there. Taking gender, 50% of the population is female, and we're not nowhere near that number of, of appointments. Um, but we have a pretty good track record, and we are increasingly active in ensuring that when the secretary sends a short list of names to the vice president, there will always be a woman on that list. Um, the templates, the, the, simply the wording, I know it is sometimes perceived as a bit irritating, but we do make sure that the wording is politically correct. Um, and as I said, the, the age diversity I find extremely important as well, which to some extent is related, but not, not fully. Um, again, having statistics, but Again, having in mind when you send a list, um, making sure that there are some more and some less experienced people on it. And there, 
we are in a lucky position in the sense that we are able sometimes to steer appointment of the entire tribunal because of the default rule under the LCA rules, where other institutions might only be able to influence the sole or presiding arbitrator, where they and we would always want somebody experienced. Um, and that also allows us, for instance, to take into consideration other um, aspects like maybe expertise, maybe not al always having a lawyer. Again, if you want a non-lawyer, having the chairperson as a non-lawyer is not ideal, but if you get to point three, you can mix and match more effectively. So I think that is very much on our mind. As I'm sure you're also aware, in, in London there's a couple of initiatives now. I suggested a year ago in, in Miami maybe some kind of pledge that would not be restricted to the institutions, but rather extend to all users, all participants, and I think there are now people working on that. And So it's an interesting, it's an exciting topic um, that Sarah and I both feel quite strongly about. Okay. Any other sort of overall concerns about international arbitration that you as an institution, but maybe also the community more generally, yeah. needs to consider and address? Yeah, because when I started, there were some, let's say, in, internal challenges, just getting to grips with, with the organization and, 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 and making things work even more efficiently and effectively. Externally, there were certain developments that affect arbitration more broadly. And I think I can give two examples, none of which are will be a surprise to, to, to people, but one is sanctions and the other is TTIP. Now maybe I should start with TTIP because in a way that is um, uh, the arbitration, uh, the LCA um, does investment arbitration obviously, but it's not a, a, a focal point necessarily. But the whole debate on investment arbitration and dispute resolution within investment arbitration was taking such an unfortunate turn that a few institutions, maybe late in the day, but realized this was really getting completely out of hand, that there was such incorrect and inappropriate information sent out through reputable journals and, 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 and magazines that we felt we really needed to become engaged to protect arbitration as such, not necessarily in an investment arbitration context. So that was, you know, it was not as if I needed even more work during my first year, but I, I did become involved in that a little bit. Sanctions more uh, acutely because of the significance of Russian cases for us um, that seemed relevant. Interestingly, um, effectively none of our Russian cases is actually impacted by sanctions, but there is certainly a perception of uh, a threat of sanctions. And there are many sanctions involving many countries, and some do have pretty dramatic practical effects, such as the Iranian sanctions, which have an effect on the bank's willingness, the bank's commercial willingness to accept funds, which if you're trying to run an institution and try, you know, try to pay your <laughs> arbitrators, it, 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 it's quite important that you um, make that work. So working with officials, and increasingly I'm happy to say working with other institutions, ICC, SEC and LCA uh, did a joint publication the other day, but also going out there, and in particular in Russia, where the actual threat is actually quite small, but still the perception uh, of a threat is significant, just to go out there and, and discuss this and, and try to be up to speed on, on on this field of law, in a way, was one of the things I, I had to get to grips with. Mm. Wow. Well, <laughs> I don't envy you on that one. <laughs> now, taking an even broader um, sort of perspective, if I can ask you how you would see commercial arbitration. I'm not yeah, talking about yeah. investment arbitration, and I agree we need to make sure that there is a, um, this is an important distinction. How, where do you see commercial arbitration in say, 10, 15, 20 years? Would it be significantly different? Will it still be around? How will it look? Like? <laughs> I think it will be around. Uh, I have no reason to, reason to think otherwise. In fact, the opposite. We see a constantly increasing caseload. Um, I know other institutions also see good cases, but we're actually seeing an increase, a steady increase over the years. Um, I would imagine that the biggest change, which I think is a good one, is that people will become increasingly savvy about the choices they make. And I rather hope that that is going to happen. So um, 
people might traditionally have chosen the one institution that they are familiar with or that happens to be seated in the place where they work or live. Um, and I think increasingly people will look at, well, what's the best for me? And I think that's part of you know, the, the age we live in where people go online and try to get facts and, 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 and hopefully make more informed choices. So for instance, an initiative that I've recently um, um, engaged with is, is we're going to be publishing information on cost and duration of arbitration, which I think is going to be really interesting because we operate on an hourly basis and just having facts out there for users to make certain comparisons, to make informed choices, I think that's increasingly important. Having regard to where do we want to have the seat, not London simply because it's London, but what is really best for me in this case. Um, and certain institutions, I think, will do better in certain regions. I think it's unlikely, in my view, that every institution will be strong everywhere in the world, in every sector. So I think we'll see increasingly a, a focus. Um, but yeah, I would imagine in 15 or 20 years, there's going to be a lot of arbitration. I don't think I'll be in this <laughs> position in 15 or 20 years, but um, uh, there will be a lot happening. We can invite you back in 15 years <laughs> to talk about your experience <laughs> uh, back, that would looking be good. back then. Um, maybe if you allow me one final question, we've taken up a lot of your time. Um, and maybe just we've talked a lot about arbitration, but I, you know, is there anything if you don't do arbitration, <laughs> what is what is your sort of preferred pastime and hobby, if I may ask you? Yeah, you may. <laughs> uh, it's not a, uh, an easy question in a way compared to the others. Um, the problem is I do a lot of other things <laughs> and I, I have a very broad and diverse interest. In a way, being in London for me sums it all up because I'm interested in quite a few things. I'm very interested in music. I love going to Wigmore Hall and listen to chamber music. Um, I like cooking and eating, um, and I like applied art in particular. I live next door to the Victoria and Albert Museum, and you know I'm already looking forward to certain exhibitions. And um, for me, being here and and you know my family is here with me um, part of the time, and it's really exciting to go and see things and really be part of this fantastic city that allows me to to do quite a lot of different things I enjoy. So music, cooking, eating, and and the V and A. That sounds like a wonderful plan to me. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jackie, for taking the time and uh, being our first guest in these uh, webinar series of Wilma Hale. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.